you seen old Terry? I haven't seen Terry in a while. Really? What, uh, where's he been? I heard that he was in the hospital last I heard. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, speaking of hospital and getting old and all that stuff, uh, um, did, didn't, didn't I hear that, that, that you've been to hell? Yeah, I've been there. Let me tell you, it's hotter than this fire. So, so Brian, what, uh, what can you tell me about it? Well, it was a long time ago. I recall it started just like any other day. I was driving to work, working as an electrician in Tucson, Arizona. There I accidentally drank some bad water at a construction site, and I got sick really, really fast. And what did I do? Well, I tried the old John Wayne cure, Jack Daniels, Jose Cuervo, old granddad, and wild turkey. Well, I'll tell you, those are bad doctors. I just got sicker. Well, let me tell you a little bit about cholera. You lose your body fluids really quick out of both ends. You become violently ill with a high fever. You feel like you have razor blades in your gut. And suddenly, I found myself all alone. I did not know I had this disease. There I was, laying on my bed, and I took my last breath. And I began to float out of my body. This surprised me. I had no knowledge of near-death experiences. I had never heard of it, wouldn't believe it in a heartbeat if anyone tried to tell me that these things existed. Because I was a militant atheist back then who believed that when you die, you just die as a dead hunk of meat. And looking down, I could see my body, it was kind of a bluish, moldy color. I saw my alarm clock, I saw my room so clearly without my glasses. Then I went straight through the ceiling and found myself in a dark void. I felt a profound love floating in this dark void. I felt a profound peace while floating there. And I kept hearing this heavenly music and this heavenly choir singing. And during their singing, all the whys of life were answered. I was heading toward this beautiful light emanating off of the distance and I was coming closer and closer. And I'm coming from this light, I saw this dark void. And in this dark void, I saw a rock. And this person standing on this rock was emanating this light. That's where the light was coming from. I got closer and closer to the light. I could see that it was coming from a person who was wearing a white robe as he was standing there. I found myself landing right before the Lord of Glory. And he had a hood over his face. He looked at me and I fell like a dead sack of wheat on the ground. Then somebody picked me up. It's almost like they had crazy glue in the back of their hand. They put it down and stood me right up. And there I was standing in front of the Lord of Glory with the hood. I knew who it was. It was Jesus. And it dawned on me. It's appointed unto men to die once. After this comes the judgment. Yes, a judgment that I could not weasel out of. A judgment that proved to me how I wasted my life. I saw all my excuses wrapped up in a nice package right before my feet where I could not say, Lord, I had no excuse. How will you stand? I had no excuses. There was no stone left unturned. The Lord began to speak to me by means of thought that I would see a land unknown that's best forgotten, but not to be left on the scene. And when I arrive at a certain place, to say his name and his title, which is Jesus Christ. Now, at the time, I didn't quite understand that. You know, I was flummoxed. I was standing there like, oh, yes. I knew I deserved my fate. The next thing I knew, I was going through a terrifying, spinning vortex, heading toward this devious, ugliest, smelliest, yellow light. It was like being inside of a tornado. It smelled horrible. It was hotter than hot. It felt like your eyeballs would literally melt out of their sockets. Then I heard noises. I heard hideous laughter. I heard mockings. I heard cursing. I heard 
foul languages that's been spoken in every language and dialect you could possibly imagine. People screaming and shrills. It was hot going through that tunnel. Next thing I knew, that yellowish light was coming closer and closer. And folks, a lot of people talk about after-death experiences and near-death experiences, and they're talking about going through a tunnel. Listen to what I'm saying. I passed through that tunnel, the spinning vortex. I was heading toward this yellowish, ugly light. I didn't know what to expect. Because the Lord just told me when I arrived to say his name and his title. Next thing I knew, I passed through that yellowish light. And I found myself falling through the sky and landed with a thud on the ground in a land unknown. It was not what I expected. I expected devils with pitchforks and flaming fire, but what did I see? I saw a house on a hill. I saw all these people coming forth, running out of the house. Welcoming me, just slapping me on the back and saying, Brian, welcome to paradise. There were like people I know who had died. And I was looking at them and I go, something is strange because they had a yellow glint in their eye. It was almost like how an alligator's eyes are, almost sort of the yellow slits. Their eyes look reptilian, folks. But then I began to notice that and they began to get a kind of a little agitated being around me and they began to morph into what they really were, demons who were mimicking humanity and they began to surround me. I was surrounded by demons. Some looked like gargoyles. Some looked like gargoyles without wings. Others looked like ancient, how the ancient pagan deities looked. Others were deformed beings of various sizes. Some were reptilian-like. Some were insect-like. Some were humanoid-like. Some were like moths and worms, little teeny worms, and fluttering moths with these vicious little vile teeth speaking blasphemies towards you. And when I said the Lord's name, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, they could not get a hold of me. They could poke me, they could prod me, they could get a punch in, but they couldn't grab hold of me. Folks, there is power in the name of Jesus Christ. There is power in his name. Then a hideous creature appeared before me, telling me to follow it. And we walked toward the horizon. This guy began laughing and stepped back at the, the sound of Jesus' name and these creatures backed off laughing and this creature turned around and stuck his hands into the horizon sky and tore it like a veil. And we stepped up out of this place that I was in. And I turned around and looked back through the tear and I noticed that I emerged out of a small cube, a cell about 10 by 10 foot square got to understand this place is so hot and the, it's like heat waves coming out of it. It is so hot. It feels like your eyeballs are going to melt in, in your eye sockets. The smell is, is awful. It's just the smell of decay and death and, and linseed oil and dead roses is the best way I can describe it. A sweet, sickly smell of death, overwhelming stench. And I looked at this cube I came out of. I looked inside the cube where all these demons were and it looked like it was as big as the all outdoors. Outside was this small little cell. I couldn't explain it. It made no sense. And this was way before Star Trek The Next Generation ever came out because they had this thing called the hollow deck. Think of these cells like being like a hollow deck in a, in a way so you get the idea of what it was like inside. But it's actually a very small area and as you moved around the scenery would change. And inside these, the demons were props, your friends, your companions. Looking around where these cubes were, I saw cubes on either side of the cubes. And cubes stacked, six high, going up, pressed tight against the roadway above. I looked out and looked around and at these things. I noticed people inside these things. Each cube had a person inside of them. And the guide began to point across this wide, broad road of destruction that we stepped out upon. He pointed to a central uh, area in this pit. So we walked to the central open core of the pit of hell, passing gaggles of demons trying to grab hold of me. Some of these demons were escorting people. I saw these tornado vortexes going through this opening in the middle of this place, going over and dropping people off. As we got to the central edge of it, I looked down and I looked up. This was the pit of hell. It was shaped how a spiral staircase looks. 
the stairs were the broad roadway was. The bricks were where these strange chambers and cells were. It was like a bottomless pit. Each wall was just packed with cubes. Walking back to the cubes, the guide pointed inside a certain cell, and I was granted this discernment like I knew the person's whole life history in an instant. I saw people inside, like the woman walking in Paris that I saw. This woman's mother hated her with a passion, disowned her, rejected her, abandoned her, betrayed her. This woman chose the ways of her mother to spread around, despite people trying to help her. She, in turn, abused, abandoned, disowned other people. And I looked at another cube. There was a wealthy man sitting there, totally, absolutely bored out of his mind. And I walked to another cube, and I saw more people, more things. What struck me was that here they were, reaping what they had sown. Inside each cell, people relived how they betrayed, abandoned, sold others out to, how they sold themselves out to drugs and alcohol. They relived everything as the victims of their lies and betrayals. They lived that over and over again. It was almost like these people were becoming just insane. It was like a woman who was in a cell who in this mortal life, she loved to toy with people like a cat played with a mouse. She loved the mental torment and the prisons that she would inflict upon folk. There she was reliving the same torments she inflicted upon her victims and she was suffering what she feared the most, a complete loss of control. She was a frenzied pile of insanity. What I witnessed shocked me. It was not all what I expected to see or hear in a place like this. Each level of the pit, there was just degrees of recompense I saw. The upper had less, and the bottom had more, just like the Bible teaches, just like Jesus describes. And then, this guide took me and began showing me around more and more, more and more cells. We passed cell after cell, and all of a sudden there's a tornado vortex that came and dropped this lady off into a cube. And there she was, entering into her cube, not knowing where she was. Kind of flummoxed a little bit, just like I was. She knocked on the door, and I stood there watching this through this thin veil, watching this progression. Saw how the cubes moved, how the everything inside the cubes, like I was in them, but standing outside of them. Full discernment of who this lady was. She died in a car wreck in 1980. She died. She went straight to this place, went through this tornado vortex, and boom. All of a sudden, she was deposited into a cell, and she, to her, it looked like the outdoor of her grandparents' farm. And she knocked on the door, and lo and behold, she saw what appeared to her to be her grandmother. It wasn't her grandmother because I could see it as a demon, given the illusion of her deceased grandmother. And her grandmother said, come, dear pudding, come into the house, come into the farm, welcome, this is paradise. Funny, they said the same thing like that to me. This is paradise. Can't you feel the love here? And she goes, oh, yes, grandmother, this is great. And there she was. She saw Uncle Joe. She saw Uncle Bob there. These weren't people. These were demons given the illusion of people. And so her grandmother said, dear pudding, let's go outside and, and, and I'll show you your favorite spot. You, this is paradise. You have forever in here. Can't you feel the love? Oh, yes, grandmother, she said. Oh, yes, I feel the love. So they walked outside. And as they walked, it was like the floor was moving like a treadmill. They were in this small little cell, about 10 by 10, walking in the illusions that were in her, in her mind. The memories of her mind were setting the scenery of this place. And so she was in here well, thinking that she was on her grandparents' farm, arriving in paradise, meeting her dead relatives. How many near-death experiences have you heard about that? And so her grandmother said, why don't you rest under the shade of those nice trees by the stream? She goes, oh, yes, grandmother. And she goes, you know, dear pudding, I'm going to bake you your favorite cookies. I'm going to bake you the favorite cookies. She had that evil grandmother look. But to, but to, the, to the woman, it looked like this was a happy grandmother. And to me, I could see that it wasn't her grandmother, it was a demon. And I could see all the demons around there, but she couldn't see the demons in her cube. There were two trees she began to walk to and some rocks. Looked like she was overlooking a hill. She came to it and saw a stream there. There, let me tell you right now, there's no water whatsoever in hell. Not a drop. 
It's too hot for water. It would evaporate. But she saw the illusion of what looked like water in a stream. And as she was walking there and saw the stream, she, got, she felt apprehensive, like, why do I belong here? Why? You know, I'm not a nice person. And then she sat down at the rock, reached in there and pulled up sand. And it wasn't water. Then she realized she wasn't in a very nice place. And the two trees were props. They were just demons, giving the illusion of trees. They're like insect-like creatures, and they put their limbs around her, and she shrieked a heart of horrible shriek. And at that instant, I had a total knowledge of who she was. She was a, she was a type of lady who, who liked to bake cookies. She liked to be a member of the PTA and do all these things. She beat her kids with a hairbrush and made them become what she wanted them to become, not what they wanted to become. She was controlling she was going to be in charge. That's what she was inside her heart. Because what was inside her heart was going to be revealed to her the mo very moment those trees surrounded her. Those demons that looked like trees just began to grab hold of her. She realized she was not in paradise. She was in a place called hell. Having her heart, what's inside of her heart, made known to her. So we turned away. We went past more cells and more people that were banished away from all hope, from all love, all goodness, all mercy. Banished away, reaping what was truly inside their hearts. People were living in nightmares, never able to wake up. How would you like that, folks? I saw this old Lordy Lord, haven't I done great things for you, preacher, that died back in the 1800s. Reliving the torments that he did, how many times he would lie on sermons. He was never saved. He wasn't a real preacher. He was a scam artist. He was in for, for the positions of power and how he could, I'm going to use modern language, hook up with the ladies and have his way with them. That's the type of guy this was. He, he was a lecherous preaching man. Dressed up in his black suit and white collar, going around like it looked like the Canefield Revivals in history books, proclaiming great visions and wonderments and captivating women and taking advantage of them. And there he was with his congregation that he was trying to preach to were demons around him, surrounded him and tore him to pieces and chasing him around. He was petrified. I saw a professor there who wrecked people's faith over and over again. He was having his own faith wrecked in everything he believed and put his faith in in a school classroom, folks. You can read about this stuff in my book, A Land Unknown, Hell's Dominion. I go in much detail there. These people always chose sin, what they loved the most. They, these people were not being tormented by God, but, but rather by what was hidden in their heart. The real person, the real you, is thoroughly exposed, revealing how one justifies impure acts. They justified how they stirred up trouble, how they, they justified how they separated people into their own little groups and clicked. They were going to exercise power. They were in control. They justified the worship of self and sorcery, hatred, fighting, envy. They, they justified how they got wasted. Folks, this is what was going on, what was in their heart, how they justified these things was all being exposed. I saw a witch down there inside of a coffin trying to scratch to get out. I saw this hypocrite church hopper, I call him, went to church to church to church, trying to get handouts from people, just handout, one handout after another. There we came to a cube set apart with demons inside, bidding me to come and sit in their examination chairs. And it was, I was becoming weak. I was becoming tired. Here I came to this last cell, and there was these demons in there pointing at this, what looked like a dentist chair, a dentist exam chair. All these demons in there, and I was weakened. I could hardly say Jesus Christ anymore. I was so tired seeing all the torment, seeing all the stuff, seeing the pressure, the hellish pressure of this place was like a great pressure being. If you ever went scuba diving down below 45 feet, you feel the water pressure. This was far greater than any pressure you feel. There I was just standing there looking at this cube and all these demons and I understood that this was my cube. This was where I was going to be placed in all eternity. And here I was with that reality hitting me. These demons bidding me, laughing and joking, come inside. 
come inside sucker come on in sucker let's get inside and it was like my feet were stuck in a miry clay and I was being propelled by a force with the goo in the mire dusty it's hard to describe dusty mire but it was like that, like dust that sucked your feet with all these little maggoty worms and these white moths fluttering by, uh, being pushed into this cube. I knew I deserved this place. The Lord judged me. I knew I wasn't a very nice person. I knew I saw myself for who and what I was really like. I knew this is where I deserved this place. I knew what would happen to me because I watched all the other cubes. I was at the end of my rope. I was without hope. And I felt a despair like I've never known in my life. This was it. And nobody really knew where I was. I couldn't wake up. I could just imagine my mom holding a funeral for me. He was a good boy. He must have made it to heaven. Yeah, right. I lied. I stole. I cheated. I hurt people. I abandoned, neglected them, abused them, just like all these other folks did in hell. I did not deserve it, because if God would allow me into heaven, like it says in the book of Isaiah, chapter 26, verse 10, I would corrupt heaven and make heaven into a hell. So there I was, facing the challenge of my life, totally abandoned. I was totally alone in a horrible place, being pushed by this force into this cell inside this pit. And I heard footsteps. And I felt a presence coming behind me. Of, I didn't know who it was. I thought it might have been the old slew foot himself ready to take me and toss me in here. And I knew I deserved it, folks. I did not know who was coming behind me. But whoever it was, the demons were getting very agitated. And they began scattering out of the cell. And I could feel these presence coming behind me and I noticed that the closer the presence got the louder the footsteps were coming was this thumping and thumping and the, the ground was beginning to vibrate and shake which footsteps that I could hear coming up behind me I was too afraid to look behind me because I didn't want the demons to grab a hold of me and put me in this cell I was at my wits end I could barely say the name of Jesus this was it I was scared I was forsaken I, I was totally without hope Totally, it was, this was the end. <laughs> and then I saw the demons scatter and run from whatever and whoever this presence was behind me. And then I felt like somebody grabbed me from my knees and my shoulders like you'd, like you'd pick up a little kid. When he, whoever picked me up, I noticed the holes in his wrist and how his bones pulled apart. It was Jesus, folks. I felt the strong arms of Jesus picking me up. It's more tired because I start to cry. You got to know that you don't deserve rescue. <laughs> you don't deserve mercy because you're a wretch. And here the Lord came back. He scooped me up in his arms. When he did, I saw the, how his bones pulled apart. For you and me, that what he went through, the agonizing pain to save wretches like us. What he went through to save us from a place like this. I turned and I to his shoulder and I cried like a baby, like I never cried before. Just wept. And to his shoulder. And he began carrying me out of this place walking and he was speaking to me he was telling me look around and I could see the demons scattering and running away and we came to this open void we floated through it and then we next thing I knew I was in that tornado like vortex hearing all the hideous noises and sounds again feeling the hot heat getting less and less and soon I went through the through the door and Jesus set my feet upon the rock <laughs> I stood there facing him. Knowing I did not deserve to be rescued. And he spoke to me some more, told me some, some things that I can't go into right now. 
and he blew on me. As he blew on me, these great mysteries and stuff flew into my mind. And after I got back and was resuscitated, I spent my life searching out these truths that he spoke to me about. They're all in the Bible. It's the only book that they're found in. It's all there. Nowhere else. He blew on me and I... He said, go in peace. And I went off the rock back into the dark void, beautiful dark void with the light and growing dimmer. I was floating back, floating back. Next thing I knew, I was floating above the bed, looking at the ceiling and, wood and seeing a fold of paint, texture paint with a fingerprint inside where you can't see with the naked eye. And then I floated right back into my body, feet first. I do not know how my neighbor found me or how, I, how it happened, this part I don't remember. All I know is on the minute it hit my body, the pain returned. All the cholera symptoms were just there. The fever was there. I, was, I could not breathe. I could not breathe. The next thing I knew, my neighbor who found me was taking me to the hospital in Tucson where I was revived. I got diagnosed as having cholera and who knows what else. They pumped fluids into me and gave me the standard treatment. I left there with, they gave me a bottle, a, a vial of paragoric. You know what paragoric is? It's, it's opium, raw opium basically, <laughs> to plug you up so you'll stop losing your fluids. So when I got back from the hospital, I came back to the, uh, to the duplex house that I lived in, sat in a beanbag chair. My roommates talked to me and said, boy, you, boy, you, you are sick. We thought we lost you. <laughs> I didn't want to tell them you did. <laughs> I didn't know what to say. I didn't want to tell them, yeah, what I saw. I saw hell. Who's going to believe me? The people think I'm nuts. They're going to haul me off in the rubber room. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't tell anybody. I said, yeah, it was rough, but I'm okay. And they went to work, and I sat in a beanbag chair in a hot, hot duplex apartment, about 94 degrees inside with the swamp cooler on, sitting in this beanbag chair, and I said, Lord, I never want to go back to that awful place. Take me, I'm yours. That's how I got born again. A little simple prayer is that. I literally felt the Spirit of God land upon me like a cool, air-conditioned wind. It just wasn't wind, it went inside me. And I knew I got born again, though I didn't know what it was or what to say. And since that time, my life has never been the same. Now I'm no longer a militant atheist, <laughs> but I'm a radical Christian going around trying to tell people about Jesus, that Jesus came to change our lives, to have a counter-revolution against the forces of darkness. So I want to ask you, what will it be? Heaven? Or will it be hell? As Galatians chapter 6 verse 7 says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man soweth, that he will also reap. So I'm asking you to come to Christ now. I'm asking you to come and pray a simple prayer. Just pray with me and follow me along. If you want to change your life and you're tired and you're feeling the hurt, the abandonment, the rejection, you don't know how to be free of it. Jesus wants you to be free of it. He wants to give you a new life. He wants to resurrect you into a new life so you don't have to keep repeating the same things in your life that are driving you crazy. If you want to escape and join this counter-revolution against the forces of darkness and try to create a place of joy and love and peace and soundness and wholeness, pray with me and say, Have mercy upon me, Lord Jesus. I'm a sinner. Forgive me, Jesus, and make me born of your spirit. Make me born again. Make me thine own, and never let me go. Lord Jesus, I'm yours. In Jesus' name, amen. That was you, and you prayed that. 
you can take time and just reflect on how you want to change your life and just pray your heart out to the Lord that you want to be saved from an awful place like this because you're going to face a reckoning like I did if you don't know Jesus. I know people are watching me laughing and scoffing. That's fine. You won't be when you die. You will be glad if you listen to me. So I'm asking you to take time to pray that prayer and just ask to be the Lord's. I ask that in Jesus' name. That's it. That's my testimony of B.W. Melvin, author of A Land Unknown, Hell's Dominion.